Well, we're glad you guys are here tonight. Thank you for joining us as we continue this study in Heroes of the Faith. Last week we kicked it off. Our pastor did as we looked at Augustine. And today we're going to turn our attention to the great reformer Martin Luther. So let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll dive in. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for allowing us to be here tonight. Thank you for this church that gives us this opportunity. And I pray that as we learn and talk about Martin Luther, God, that you would cause us to learn from him and God ultimately worship and praise you. We pray that you'd be honored during this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, so you're probably at least somewhat familiar with the name Martin Luther. But I think as we think about him, we, we begin with a question. How could really an unknown professor at a pretty inconsequential university leave such a long-lasting, indelible imprint on the church such that we still feel the effects today? What was it about Martin Luther? Even the great uh, poet and writer Ralph Waldo Emerson would say, Martin Luther, the reformer, is one of the most extraordinary persons in history and has left a deeper impression of his presence in the modern world than any other except Columbus. That's Emerson putting Luther and Columbus right there side by side. And so Martin Luther is often credited with sort of sparking the Reformation. But as we think about just that period, uh, there's a couple things that we need to understand on the front end. First of all, you know, at that time, it wasn't like, you had an option to be, you know, a Baptist or a Presbyterian or Methodist or Lutheran. You were either part of the church, meaning the Roman Catholic Church, or you were, you know, a pagan. That, those were your only two options. But over the course of history, there began to be these stirrings for Reformation, these different calls for Reformation that came from various places. And so you see it with John Wycliffe in England. You see it with John Huss in Bohemia, which is modern uh, Czech Republic. You see it in, in the work of Erasmus. Erasmus, this great uh, humanist, took it upon himself to begin collecting Greek manuscripts and compiling a Greek New Testament. And we might think, yeah, that's that's always been around. But during that time, there wasn't a, a Greek New Testament put together. Erasmus did that. He did that in 1516, one year before Luther would famously nail his 95 Theses on the door there at Wittenberg. And so you're starting to see sort of these calls for reformation from different parts of Europe. And then even there were contemporaries of Luther, guys like William Tyndale. He's often called the father of the English Reformation. He, he was the first to translate the Bible from Greek into English and then publish it. Uh, you know, uh, the name John Calvin in France and Zwingli in Switzerland. And so Martin Luther, yes, he was a gigantic figure. But there were calls for Reformation all throughout Europe at that time. When we talk about biography, and when we, especially with a title like Heroes of the Faith, it's important that we understand all of the people that we're going to talk about are people, just like you and me, that are sinful humans. You take Luther, he was incredibly gifted and obviously incredibly used by God, but he was also a, a flawed man. People would say that he was, he was volatile, he was often offensive, he was quick-tempered. His good friend, uh, Philip Melanchthon, even in his funeral eulogy for Luther, mentioned, yeah, his, he had a sharp tongue and a heated temper. So it was like that well known that even in his funeral eulogy, here his friend is talking about his sharp tongue and his quick and his heated temper. But, you know, history is filled with people like that. The Bible is filled with people like that. We've, as we were going through the Old Testament, you know, last time I stood up here, we, we looked at the book of Judges. And we talked about people that were used by God in incredible ways that were also incredibly flawed people. 
And so when we, when we talk about Luther as this great hero, I don't want you to get the idea that he is perfect because he definitely was not. Okay, so with that kind of as our basis, let's kind of walk through on your notes there, you have a timeline of his life. And so we're going to walk through that and talk through that a little bit. You see he was born in 1483 in Germany. And I think we even have a picture of the house where he was born. Now let me talk about this picture for a minute. You might recognize someone in this picture. Um, on this side of the picture is, is a group of people. On the other side of the street, there is a tour guide who is, is teaching us and telling us all about this house. And then you'll see standing next to him is our pastor. And if we had a little bit more time, I could tell you about more and more instances that occurred like this on the trip that the pastor and I took to Germany a few years ago. But it was, it was a great trip. We went uh, in 2017 on the 500th anniversary year of Luther nailing his thesis to the door there. But that house that you're seeing, that's the house where he was born. Not a whole lot is known about his really early life. His uh, parents are working class people that had kind of worked themselves up to be uh, sort of the upper middle class. And like most parents, you want your kids to be even better. And so his, his father especially had aspirations for Luther to pursue a career in law. So that was the plan. He uh, began studying law at the University of Erfurt there in 1501. And that was, that was going to be his his life path. In 1505, though, something significant happened in the life of Martin Luther. He was traveling back to his hometown, and he was caught in a terrible storm. He was knocked to the ground because of the lightning. He was terrified, and, and maybe it was the, the medieval uh, time there, but he, he almost kind of looked at the storm to have a divine punishment associated with it. He was kind of mystical at that time and, and really fearing for his life. He cries out, help me, Saint Anne, and I will become a monk. Well, he was helped. He didn't die. And true to his word, just a couple of weeks later, he joined the Augustinian cloister. It's, it's the most rigorous. There were seven monasteries in that city at that time, and this Augustinian one was the most rigorous of all of them. And Luther threw himself into his work there as a monk. A couple years later, he led his first Catholic mass. He was so nervous that day, he almost ran away. His father, you know, who had wanted him to become a lawyer. Uh, man, Luther's decision to enter the monastery really estranged them for a while. But his father made plans to be there on this day as he was leading his first mass. And Luther stood up and he began reciting the introductory parts of the mass. And then he got to these words. He says, we offer unto thee the living, the true, the eternal God. And those words, when Luther said them, those words shook him. And he was still operating under this idea that, that God was was out to get him for some reason. And he would later write about this day, and he would say, at these words, I was utterly stupefied and terror-stricken. I thought to myself, with what tongue shall I address such majesty, seeing that all men ought to tremble in the presence of even an earthly prince? Who am I that I should lift up mine eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty? The angels surround him. At his nod, the earth trembles, and shall I, a miserable little pygmy, say, I want this, or I ask for that, for I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and am speaking to the living, the true, the eternal God. Luther took those words really seriously. And as he served there in that monastery, he took his work really seriously, that the repetitive nature of the mass never became sort of a rote exercise for him because he, he was so guilt-ridden and had this view of God. All, every time he said those words, they had deep significance for him. 
And so he threw himself into this work and so much so that he would even say, if any monk ever got to heaven by his monkery, it would have been me. He was depriving himself of food and fasting. And he would say, he's like, it's a good thing that I got out of that because if I would have continued, it would have killed me the way he was living there. But for all of his spiritual labors, for all of his work to somehow measure up to, to what he thought God wanted from him, his spiritual crisis just deepened. It worsened. He would spend hours listing his sins, examining his sins, and he was afraid that any sin that he forgot about, any sin that he did not confess would remain unforgiven. There was one instance that they wrote about where he spent six hours in the confessional. The, the confessor actually got aggravated with him. Sometimes even leaving the confessional, he would remember a sin that he had forgotten to confess. And you can just see how living like that would just make you anxious, would make you desperate as you feel the weight of your own sin and you really can't figure out any way to get out from under it. And that's where Luther was. At that time, he started teaching philosophy to some of the younger students there at the university. And then his, his mentor turned his attention to the Bible and said, you know what, why don't you start teaching the Bible? And so in 1512, he earned his doctorate of theology and he began holding the position of the chair in biblical theology and moved him to Wittenberg. And he would spend the rest of his life there working in that city. It was a small village, about, that, about 2,000, 2,500 people at that time. But as Luther began teaching the Bible and studying the Bible, he began to be convinced of a couple things. He started to see that, that the primary source for our theology, what we believe, was not these church traditions, but was actually just the Bible. So he started wrestling with that, and he also became increasingly convinced that what the church was teaching about salvation is not what the Bible taught about salvation. So he started having another sort of spiritual crisis moment. And so we fast forward a couple years, 1517, this infamous year. Now, before we talk about him nailing his thesis on the door there, we need to talk a little bit about what was happening at that time. So the Pope, the Pope's lasting legacy there, the Sistine Chapel in Rome. You guys have probably seen pictures of that. Maybe you've visited it. But it, it was an enormous venture. It was uh, very costly. Michelangelo, I guess, wasn't cheap at that time. Um, but the, the church treasuries had sort of been emptied. And so they began wondering, well, well, what can we do? How can we raise some money for the church? And so what they what they came up with was this idea of indulgences. Maybe you've heard that term before, indulgences. But basically, the purchase of an indulgence was a complete forgiveness of sins. It was a pretty good deal if you think about it. You sin, you buy an indulgence, you're forgiven. It sort of fast tracks the whole confession part of, of what they were doing at that time. And you think about, really, the, the whole penitential system there of the Catholic Church was, was this idea of grace canceling out sin. So there was this constant weighing that was happening, like how much, how much grace here, how much good things, how many bad things have we done? So they, they believed and they taught that basically the saints that had lived had lived such good lives for God that they had sort of stockpiled this grace. And so normal people like you and I could sort of draw on their grace. And so we would pray to the saints. We would receive grace from the saints. And of course, Luther had a lot of problems with this. But then, specifically, there was a man by the name of Johann Tetzel who began traveling and selling these indulgences. And when he came to Luther's hometown, that was sort of the last straw. He was a pretty slick guy. 
in my mind, I picture like a televangelist. He was probably dressed really nicely. He had a really nice horse and buggy or whatever it was that he would have been traveling in. But Tetzel came and he even created this little jingle. He says, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from Purgatory Springs. And so if you thought that maybe, you know, you had a loved one, like, he's like, yeah, I know how that person lived. There's no way they're in heaven right now, right? They're in purgatory. Uh, you could actually buy indulgences for, for dead people to, to get them out of purgatory. So you could see how, how crazy this is. And for Luther, as he's looking at what the Bible says and what the Bible says about salvation, he just started to realize this is not right. Like we're robbing people and we're doing it based on a complete lie. You know, if believers have Christ's righteousness, then what is the point of purgatory? Forgiveness can't be bought. Forgiveness is the free gift of Christ. And so, on that day, October 31st, 1517, Luther wanted to start a discussion. And so he wrote these 95 theses in the introduction to them, he says, Out of love for the truth and the desire to bring it to light, the following propositions will be discussed at Wittenberg. And he nailed that to the door of the church there in Wittenberg. Luther didn't think at that time that he was starting a reformation. You can see the door there. The wooden door that he nailed it to uh, is long gone, but the words of his thesis are now uh, inscribed on that door that you can see there. Luther didn't think he was starting a reformation at that time. He thought he was starting a discussion. He had written his thesis in Latin, which was the, the academic language of the day. But what happened is that that was translated into German and distributed, and now something big has started to happen. Now, before we get into that, there's another significant thing that happens in Martin Luther's life, and it, it's interesting that really his conversion, most people would say, happened after that, in about 1518. See, in 1515, he had started lecturing on the book of Romans. And as a scholar and a theologian, he, he wanted to understand what Paul was saying in Romans. But he got about as far as Romans chapter 1. And he got stuck. Romans chapter 1 verse 17 says this, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Luther got stuck on that phrase. And he would say, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Because if the gospel is the revelation of the righteousness of God, or maybe you think about it, the justice of God, how could that possibly be good news? Because Luther knew, hey, I'm a sinner. So how is it possibly good news for me to learn about the righteousness of the holy, living, eternal God? Listen to what he says. He says, I greatly longed to understand Paul's epistle to the Romans and nothing stood in the way but that one expression, the justice of God, because I took it to mean that justice whereby God is just and deals justly in punishing the unjust. My situation was that although an impeccable monk, I stood before God as a sinner, troubled in conscience, and I had no confidence that my merit would assuage him. Therefore, I did not love a just and angry God, but rather hated and murmured against him. He continues, night and day I pondered until I saw the connection between the justice of God and the statement that the just shall live by faith. Then I grasped that the justice of God is that righteousness by which through grace and sheer mercy, God justifies us through faith. Thereupon I felt myself to be reborn and to have gone through open doors into paradise. The whole of Scripture took on a new meaning, and whereas before the justice of God had filled me with hate, now it became to me inexpressibly sweet in greater love. It was this discovery from Romans chapter 1 that changed Martin Luther, that changed the church, and it changed the world. 
So his thesis makes its way all the way to the Pope, and initially the Pope uh, dismissed the writings, didn't think much would come of it, but, but these rumblings continued. And so in 1520, the Pope issued uh, what they called a papal bull. This, was, this is him ordering him, hey, look, you have 60 days. From the time you receive this, you have 60 days to recant and say you are out of your mind, you take it all back. Well, on the 60th day, Luther stood up in the town of Wittenberg and publicly burned the bull in front of everyone. It was the kind of guy he was. The next year, 1521, they meet at, you see there in your notes, the diet is what it looks like. I think a true German, like, like me, right, Pastor? A true German <laughs> would, say, would say the deet. The deet of, of Worms, but, you know, it looks like diet. Um, but this, this meeting was over, the, the Roman emperor oversaw this meeting. And so Luther came to this meeting expecting a debate. He expected to have a conversation. He expected a chance to defend his views because, again, he wasn't trying to destroy the church. He was trying to reform it from the inside. He saw that there was change that needed to happen, and he wanted to help make that change. But Rome didn't want to debate. Rome didn't want to talk about it. Rome wanted him to shut up and go away. And so when he got there, they asked him two questions. They had his books piled up on a table, and they said, the first question was, are these your books? Are these your writings? Did you write this? And he said, yeah, the books are all mine, and I've written more. But then they said, do you recant? Luther standing there in front of all of these powerful people, including the emperor himself. He said, you know, look, can I have some time to think it over? <laughs> Another picture of, of an honest guy here. And they said, we'll give you one day. So the next day they come back. They ask the question again, do you recant? Again, Luther wanted to debate. He wanted to talk. He wanted to have a conversation. They said, we're not interested in that. Do you recant? And Luther stood up in Worms in front of the emperor, in front of all these powerful people, and he says, Unless I am convinced by scripture and by clear reason, for I do not trust either in the pope or in councils alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound to the scriptures I have quoted, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscious, I, conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. Well, that didn't go over very well. <laughs> they, uh, they gave him a couple of weeks. They excommunicated him during that couple of weeks. He was, in your notes, I think it says kidnapped. It's pretty interesting. Uh, he had one powerful friend, at least, Frederick the Wise. Frederick was the one who had founded the university there in Wittenberg. Frederick owned several castles. And so he said, look, here's what we're going to do. I want, I want this guy to be, to be taken to one of my castles. Now, I don't want to know which castle it is because... You know, he, he needed plausible deniability, right? He needed to be able to say, look, I don't know where he is. So all that he knew was he had arranged for Luther to be taken to one of his castles. And so that's what had happened. Now, under this imperial ban, so the emperor said they issued this ban on Luther. So that meant that Luther could be captured and killed. Anyone harboring him could, could suffer the same fate. So this was, this was a serious time. So Luther goes there to this castle in Wartburg. We got a picture of that castle. Luther spent nine months in that castle. He assumed the identity of an old knight. I think that would have been interesting. Um, and during this time, as he was sort of locked away, Luther began translating the New Testament from Greek into German, which had never been done before. He did this in less than three months. It's incredible. 
Later in his life, he would oversee a translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into German. That would take a little longer, about, about 12 years. But Luther finished this, but he was never completely satisfied. He would continue refining that translation for the rest of his life. They, they say that the last written page that he ever looked at was a page from his German New Testament as he was continuing to tweak it and refine it and make it as good as it could possibly be. But people would say his translation into German played a profound impact just on the German language, just linguistically. The, the German grammar was affected by Luther's translation. He said, I, I wanted to make Moses sound so German that everyone would forget that he was a Jew. You know, he was trying to take the language and make it as much in the vernacular of the people as he could because he knew, and we're going to talk more about this in a minute if we can ever get there, uh, that there is power in God's word and the people needed to hear it and he wanted to give it to them. Well, after his nine months there locked away, Rome was occupied with a bunch of other political things. They weren't super interested in chasing down a uh, troublesome monk anymore, so he returns to Wittenberg. A couple years later, he marries uh, his wife, Katharina. They have six children in nine years. So he's filling his household. Um, that same year, he holds the, the first Protestant service there in that city. One of the main changes to that service was, you know, before, at that time, the Catholic Mass would have been all in Latin. Well, the, the problem was, unless you were an academic, if you were just a regular person, you didn't know Latin. So you'd go there and sit through a service that you didn't understand a word of. And Luther said, well, that's not what this is supposed to be. So the service was in German. It was the end. The sermon took a central spot in the service. Before, the altar, the Eucharist, was the centerpiece of the service. And now, the sermon was where God's word would be read and taught to people. A couple years later, the plague. This is the bubonic plague. So, Black Death, if you remember that, that was a couple hundred years prior, where about 60% of the European population died from that. But every few years, it would kind of pop up and go for a couple of months, and then it would fade away, and then a few years later, it would pop up again. Well, here it comes to Wittenberg. The faculty and students there at the university fled. In fact, Martin Luther was, was ordered to leave, but he refused, because again, that's the kind of guy he is. He does what he, what he wants to do, what he thinks is right. 18 people in the city died. He turned, he ended up turning his house where his pregnant wife and his children were. He ended up turning his house into a hospital at that time. So here he was, the theology doctor, taking the role of a medical doctor as, as best as he could during a plague in the city. During that same year, he wrote the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And you think about that. So we're in 1527 now. We're 10 years removed from when he had posted his 95 thesis on the door there. This great hymn is based on Psalm 46. But as he's reflecting on the plague, and a lot of people say, too, he reflects on his time hidden away in, in Wartburg Castle thinking about the fact that God is our refuge and strength, our very present help in trouble. A couple years later, Luther would write his catechisms, the large and small catechism. The large one was more for clergy. The small one was for children. Luther wasn't the, the first one to invent the idea of a catechism, but he was, I believe, the first one to write a catechism specifically designed for children. Because he wanted to make sure that our children knew what to believe. That our children knew what the Bible said and what the Bible taught. Luther would say that, that he was most proud of all the things that he had written, which were many. He was a prolific writer. 
but of his, of his book, The Bondage of the Will and the Small Catechism. He would say those are, everything else could be burned as, as long as those two things survive. 1530, he writes the Augsburg Confession with his friend Philip Melanchthon. This is the official statement of faith for the Lutheran Church. It sort of officially set Protestantism over and against Catholicism. 1546, he dies at the age of 62. He's buried there at the, the church in Wittenberg, the same church where he nailed the theses to the door. He's buried in that church. And you think about his legacy. John Bunyan, the great author of Pilgrim's Progress, he said this, I do prefer this book of Martin Luther upon the Galatians. Talking about Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians. He said, I do prefer this book, accepting the Holy Bible before all books that ever I have seen as most fit for a wounded conscience. The famous brothers John and Charles Wesley, both of them were converted in large part through reading Luther's commentaries on Romans and Galatians. The, the power in God's word. So you think about the sermons that he preached, hundreds of sermons that he preached. You think about the hymns that he had written, the catechism that he was written that was rehearsed in homes, the Bible translation that he had done. What an incredible legacy. I mean, there, there's a lot of people that we would be talking about and talking about proudly for just doing one of those things, right? Right? Maybe you think of Isaac Watts, the great hymn writer. You think about George Whitfield, the great preacher. And here he, he's doing all of it. So what can we learn from Martin Luther? I want to talk about a couple lessons that we can learn from his life. First, I want you to see the importance of Scripture. The power of the Word. You know, when you think about the Reformation, and one historian would say this, that he said, the student of the Reformation is always impressed with the way in which the futures of the Reformation were so closely identified with the translation of the Bible into the common tongue of the people. One of the things that the Reformers did was they unleashed the power of God's Word onto people. They let God's Word speak. In fact, Luther would say that as he looks back on his own life and his legacy he says, I simply taught, I preached, I wrote God's word, otherwise I did nothing. And while I slept, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing, and the word did everything. That's how Luther would think about his legacy, what he had done. See, Luther was called a heretic for putting the Bible above church councils, and church traditions. But Luther knew that, man, the, the scriptures require absolute obedience. We stand under their authority. We submit to its authority. We stand underneath it against culture wars, against progressives that are trying to change it. I mean, you, you think about the Garden of Eden. That was the very, one of the very first Lies introduced into the world. Did God really say? And don't you hear that in our culture today? Does God really say that? Do you really believe that? Is that really how things are supposed to be? Is that really how you're supposed to live? Are you sure? Aren't you kind of old-fashioned? Aren't you kind of legalistic? And Luther would say, well, this is, this is what the Word says. You get these great Reformation, which we hear all the time around here. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone, sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola Christus, through Christ alone, soli deo glorio, to the glory of God alone. You know, Luther didn't just preach this, he lived it for a number of years. He said that he would read through the Bible twice each year. He probably had the entire book of Psalms memorized. That's pretty impressive. Luther knew the importance of Scripture. 
But Luther also knew, number two, the importance of grace. Justification, the idea of justification by faith, was the key issue of the Reformation. Luther insisted that it was this righteousness that existed outside humanity. So so you get this phrase, alien righteousness. He wasn't talking about some kind of sci-fi thing. It means it was a righteousness that exists outside of us. It's not our righteousness. It's not our goodness. It's not our works. Later Protestant writers would say that this is the issue. Justification is the issue by which the church stands or falls. And so there's a Latin phrase that Luther would use. Simul justus et peccator. At one and the same time, righteous and a sinner. What do you mean by that? At one and the same time, righteous and a sinner. Luther would illustrate it by talking about a sick man who goes to see a doctor. And the doctor prescribes for the sick man medicine that will cure him a plan of recovery to follow. And the guy leaves the doctor's office and Luther says, so is the man well? He says, well, in a sense, yes, right? He has a plan, he knows he can recover, but in another sense, he's still sick. And he would say in the same way, Christ has brought this ill man to the inn to be cared for and has begun to cure him, having promised him the most certain cure leading to eternal life. Now, is this man perfectly righteous? Well, no. He is a sinner, in fact, but a righteous person by the sure reckoning and promise of God that he will continue to deliver him from sin until he has completely cured him. And so, he is totally healthy in hope, but a sinner, in fact. He has the beginning of righteousness and so always continues more and more to seek it while realizing that he is always unrighteous. This idea that God has justified us through Christ. That what matters on the day of our death is not what we have done, but what Christ has done for us. This next quote, I've used it. I think I've probably even used it in this room before, but it's just so good. Luther says, so when the devil throws your sins in your face and declares that you deserve death and hell, tell him this. I admit that I deserve death and hell. What of it? For I know one who suffered and made satisfaction on my behalf. His name is Jesus Christ, Son of God, and where he is, there I shall be also. Luther knew the importance of grace. Number three, Luther knew the importance of dependence. Luther wrote a lot about prayer. In fact, one of his books on prayer, he wrote for his barber. He was talking to his barber. His barber was asking him questions about prayer. He goes and, you know, writes a book about it. He's famous for saying, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. Another quote that you've probably heard, as is is the business of tailors to make clothes and cobblers to make shoes, so it is the business of Christians to pray. When he was teaching people how to study the Bible, how do you study the Bible? He would say this, look, kneel down in your private little room, with sincere humility and earnestness, and pray, God, through his dear Son, graciously grant you his Holy Spirit to enlighten and guide you and give you understanding. Luther knew and he taught that prayer was essential to even just how we read and study our Bible. But I think we should also mention that Luther understood not just dependence on God through prayer, but dependence on fellow believers. You know, another thing that we say a lot around here is that, that you were not designed, I was not designed to live this Christian life like a lone ranger. You know, we're not out on the wild frontier by ourselves. God has given us a community. He's given us a family. And we are here to bear one another's burdens. We are here to encourage one another as we walk this Christian life together. And Luther understood this. He would write to his friend Melanchthon as he was there in that castle at Wartburg for those nine months. And and he was just open and honest with his friend this one time. And he says, I sit here at ease, hardened and unfeeling, praying little, 
grieving little for the church of God, burning rather in the fierce fires of my untamed flesh. For the last eight days, I have written nothing, nor prayed, nor studied, partly from self-indulgence. Pray for me, I beg you, for in my seclusion here, I am submerged in sins. Man, Luther wasn't the guy who was always trying to put on a false face, who was always trying to be like, yeah, everything's great. Yeah. No, Luther knew the importance of community, the importance of depending on our brothers and sisters in Christ to help us when we need them. Number four, the importance of courage. You know, Luther stood there. I read that long quote from from the diet of Worms. But he's standing there and, it, and he refuses to recant because he knows that he can't. He says, my conscience is bound by Scripture. I can't take that back. These are God's words. These are God's truths. Our world needs Christians just like that, just right now. Christians who are willing to say, this is, this is what God says. The importance of courage. Number five, the importance of worship. You'd expect me to talk about that some, right? But you think about Luther, not only the professor and the theologian and the reformer, but Luther, the the pastor, Luther, the preacher. He was a regular preacher. There were two churches there in Wittenberg. He was a regular preacher there. His church in Wittenberg had two services. They had a 5 a.m. service. Wouldn't you like to go to that? (laughs) And a 9 a.m. service that they actually called the later service. (laughs) Maybe that was a leftover from his his days at the monastery, but Luther was an early riser. He liked to get out there. He liked to get it done. So 5 a.m., that's our new service time. (laughs) But, But Luther, there was so much about just the church. We've already kind of talked about it some going from Latin to German, but there was so much about the church service that Luther changed that we still feel the effects of now. We talked about the importance of preaching. Luther really explored this idea of the priesthood of all believers as he started to to say, hey, look, people can have the Bible because people can interpret the Bible so that when they hear teaching that is contradictory to the Bible, they can say, hey, wait a minute. My Bible says this. Let's have a conversation. That wasn't happening before before that. The priesthood of believers also means that, hey, Mary and the saints, what are they there for, right? We don't need anybody else to come between us and God. We can go directly to God. Jesus is our mediator. He said a lot about music. He said, after theology, I accord music the highest place and the greatest honor. Luther was a musician. We talked about him writing hymns, not only the lyrics, but also the music. He played uh, the lute. I guess he was pretty good. Um, But he would say, yeah, God's word needs to be preached and sung, for the word is intellect, but the song is feeling. He was preaching the dedication service of a church one day, and he said, the purpose of this new house may be such that nothing else may happen in it except that our Lord himself may speak to us through his holy word and we respond to him through prayer and praise. I mean, that's what the church service is, right? It's God's word, it's prayer, and it's praise. The importance of worship. And lastly, the importance of discipleship. We've talked about this this catechism that Luther wrote. It was probably his most widely read work, if you think about it, as households and families all throughout Germany were reciting this together in their homes. But this is what Luther would say. He said, we cannot perpetuate the Christian doctrine unless we train the people who come after us and succeed us in our office and work so that they in turn may bring up their children successfully. Thus the word of God and the Christian church will be preserved. Therefore, let every head of a household remember that it is his duty by God's injunction and command to teach or have taught to his children the things they ought to know. And that's what we believe around here, right? We Thank God we have great children's ministry, great student ministry. But 
but it's not just up to the church, right, to, to disciple the kids. That's, that's a joint effort. The church comes alongside the families. The church is supporting, reinforcing the things that the families are learning and doing in their homes. Another way that Luther did this, maybe a little more informally, you see there the last uh, point in your notes is something called table talk. Luther was an incredibly hospitable person. Thankfully, his wife was too, or I guess she was. Um, together they were. Um, and so people would come through their house all the time. Not only their, their children, they ended up uh, having uh, four other children live there with them a lot of time, but all the guests and, and things would come. They'd stay for dinner. After dinner, they'd usually sing together. And then after singing, they'd come back to the table and they would gather for theological discussion. I think we have a picture of, of that table. That is Luther's dining room. And the table, it's a pretty small table, uh, but they gather around that room and uh, his, his students would come and they'd take notes about the discussions that would happen and eventually these notes were compiled into a work that we call Table Talk. This is where we really start to see Luther in his humor and his wit. We hear some of the, some of the funny things he says, some of the maybe offensive things that he says. He, he once told a man who was about to be married, he said, look, be Lord in your house whenever your wife is not at home. <laughs> but in fact, his students would say that his wife, Katie, she was involved in these conversations so much to the point where sometimes it would basically just be Martin and Katie just having a conversation and the guests and whoever else was there were almost just kind of observing this theological conversation that was happening between husband and wife. What a cool picture. We talked a lot about Luther tonight. I hope that you've, you've learned something. I hope that you've been inspired by him, but we've just sort of mentioned his great hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And I want to end tonight really just by reading through this. I want you to pay attention to, to what he writes, especially taking your mind back to that timeline, wrote this in the year that the plague came to his city, that his house was turned into a hospital. You think about everything that he had seen up to that point, the fact that he was technically for the rest of his life still under this imperial ban from the Roman Empire, he says, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. He recognizes the, the power of Satan there. And he continues, did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. You ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth, that's Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. Lord Sabaoth, his name from age to age the same, and he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure, for lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word capital W, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Think about Luther writing that 
living his life under this imperial ban of an earthly kingdom. An earthly kingdom that today doesn't exist. But God's word still exists. The kingdom of God still exists. And the church of God continues forward because we're not based on a person, a personality, a tradition. We're based on the truth of God's word and the glorious truth of justification through Christ. And we get all that from this great reformer, Martin Luther. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for some time to learn and reflect and consider. And we're so thankful to think about, God, the fact that we are here today standing on the shoulders of all the great people that have come before us. We're thankful for the way that you have used them. We're thankful for the way that you have preserved your word and that you continue to use it, God. May you shape us, continually shape us through your word to be more like Christ. And as we go out to our neighborhoods and to our jobs and to our schools, Lord, may you cause people to see the glorious truth of the gospel through our lives and through our words. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.